You are listening to Rollmongers Actual Play Podcast. Prologue. Set just prior to the War for the Crown adventure path, Honor's Echo is a Pathfinder Society adventure which will introduce our band of cavaliers and their followers to the inner sea region setting of Taldor. Many dangers await our band, both far field and deep within the political arena. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rollmonger's Actual Play Podcast presents Dice Before Dishonor. Tonight, our prologue series begins where we are playing Season 8, one of the last modules listed. It is set in and around Taldor, and you get to meet several of the major NPCs that arrive, and the players get to schmooze in Crownfall. So, live or die, make it or break it, our party, completely consisting of mainly Cavaliers, Samurai, Cavalier, Alternates, or whatever, we're going to see if our promise can be kept, if we can do this. Welcome to Honor's Echo prologue part one now if you have listened to our clip you have already listened to me introducing the cast of players as well as me introducing the cast of characters with a little bit of backstory discussing how certain nobles that got shall we say dethroned uh, by the major nobility as a scapegoat during the elven tongue war some of them their descendants want a piece of the pie again they want back up there including your current benefactor, your employer for this evening, Mr., as you can see here, Romeo Alcasti. For the podcast audience, all I can describe this guy is, is, um, hmm, Mercutio comes to mind of Shakespeare. You have the typical puffy hat with the one feather coming out the front long sideways. Wonderful striped balloon pants with the later hosen uh, down below. A rapier to side. And the proverbial Santa Claus looking cape with the white fur trim and red doffed off one shoulder, puffy sleeves. And this guy is a throw up color menagerie of gold, reds and burgundies. Did I miss anything? He has no? a beard. And oh, a red. Yes, he does. He has a red beard <laughs> and a perplexed look on his face like he could really make things happen in this capital or is possible as a man possible of anything because he's a man with strong apparitions and agenda and a strong monobrow. And a strong monobrow, which makes him twice as formidable. (laughs) So. His disappointment never ends. The disappointment never ends. (laughs) Is that like the song that never ends? The disappointment that never ends? No. All right. (laughs) Drawing your attention to the handout section, gentlemen, we are going to start with letters that you have received. You have each received a copy of each of these six. However, you do notice that penned at the top in sort of an afterthought, one of the six copies has something more personable to each of you. Let's begin with the first letter that goes to Frank's character, Lord Samish Gildervarth. Do you care to read aloud, sir? No. (laughs) Yeah. If you want allies on this trip, it might be a really good idea. That It, it, It like just populated for me. Oh, okay. Hi, hi, yeah. Where are the letters? I'm looking, looking. No. Is this the one that says greetings? Earlier, is is that the correct one? Earlier in her military career. Yep. Sure. Okay. Greetings. Earlier in her military career, my ancestor Honoria received knightly honors from the Church of Eroden. Although Eroden's blessings may not seem like such a great honor now. It was with tremendous prize before his death, particularly for a person as young as she was at the time. A bronze bust commemorating the occasion still rests in the vaults below the Basilica of the Last Man. I don't believe that it's properly guarded there, and I would like your help in convincing the erudites to relinquish it to me. Once you have returned the bust to me, 
I will ensure that you are generously rewarded for your time. And that is assigned sincerest thanks, Romero Alacasti? I don't sound like that. Not in the slightest. The man himself appears in the doorway of the gentleman's parlor where the five of you have been dwelling, exchanging letters, and deciding if this is actually legit or some sort of hoax. Doffing his cap, showing a shock of red curly hair to, to match the beard, dusting off the travel of the road, somewhere in the heart of a para, a select wine-tasting parlor of a subnoble has let you guys sort of camp out for the afternoon to compare these letters, bring yourselves together, and what is this? The man who wrote them appears in the doorway. Greetings, my friends. I thought to legitimize and possibly sweeten the deal, shall we say, I would accompany you to the church, the bastion of the last man, the Belisia, and introduce you to Brother Velikus myself. I have petitioned him constantly over these few months to have him return the bus to my care and my family to no but any uh, frustrating end. Would you accompany me and we shall see if we can set this right once and for all and prove to you gentlemen that I am sincere in this endeavor. And he kind of makes a circling motion, you know, encompassing the five of you all as well as encompassing the fact that all the other letters talking about other places he wishes you to go, the man puts in an appearance. What say you? Well, of course, you may count me in. Wherever my companions go, I shall go as well. <laughs> Pretty, of course. Travel with my friends. Is, is that it? Travel with your friends? Okay. Yes, we shall go. Wonderful. I'm glad you've taken the time to get acquainted. I had heard rumors, and I have to admit, I did a little bit of vetting. I hope you'll excuse me, he says, clutching his hands sort of gingerly in a prayer fashion, folding his cap. I know some of you may not know each other personally, but I was hoping you would get along and hit it off regally in astute fashion. And it seems you have, he says, spreading his arms wide in a grand fashion. Shall we go? My carriage awaits outside. I shall meet you at the Belicia of the Last Man. It is a church to Aerodin. Sounds like our host is offering to pay for the meal, boys. Oh, I'm never one for turning down a meal. <laughs> That's good on you. Push myself up and big hand on the shoulder. I like you already. For our podcasting audience at home, going around the room quickly, as each man exits to either enter the carriage with Elcasti or don his own horse, starting left to right on our Roll20 screen with Frank. Can you describe the man that's following in line behind your benefactor, Romero sure. Casti? Well, my character is uh, Lord Samish Gildervarth. Um, he's uh, just shy of six feet, kind of slightly built, not not too heavy. Uh, sandy blonde hair. Uh, no, no real facial hair, but, you know, maybe the, the five o'clock shadow. But he's got very, he's very nicely dressed. I mean, obviously he comes from money. Perhaps he doesn't have it himself, but his family did look after him at one point in time. Uh, his armor's up to snuff. His weapons are very finely polished and taken care of. Uh, kind of what you would expect from a, a an aspiring knight. Awesome. Now, as I said before, the clip that we've already aired uh, goes into these characters in a little bit more detail. But I wouldn't mind if you happen to have dropped the name or role-playing hint of the trait that you took tying yourself into the campaign. Okay. So my character is related to the Stetvian family, and that is, although distantly related, he is, you know, he can, can trace his lineage to the crown prince. So distant relation of the biggest family. On the campus. biggest family, yeah. All right. Next through the doorway, stepping out into the lit street, Leon. Uh, about five, six, very, very light build. Like couldn't be more than 150, 130, maybe even. Um Otherwise, his armor is also similarly immaculate, but nowhere near as fancy. It's just a bunch of leather, but it does look quite la quite well lacquered. Um, strung across his back is, I, it looks like a piece of wood, uh, but it's probably most likely an unstrung bow. Um, he has a very determined look upon his face, and as you as we walk through the hallway, he's always stopping and greeting the uh, greeting the various passerbys that he meets, um, shaking the hands and. Never quite seems to not know someone. Oh, so you're 
kissing hands and shaking babies? Don't shake the babies. Sorry, my GCP is showing. You obviously are glad-handing the public, is what you're saying. Oh, I'm not glad-handing. I, I legitimately seem to know pretty much everyone. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's a lot of winking and pointing and almost yeah. finger-gunning the odd guy, the baker, the candlestick maker. Exactly. All right. Next, we have Mr. Tapo. Hi, I'm Clinton, and uh, I'm playing a Talden Castellan Cavalier. This is more of a city defender soldier style Cavalier. Uh, he uh, is, comes from a, well, his background is not to be discussed. When uh, he was sitting around <laughs> with the other nobles, he kept very quiet. He didn't really speak up much. I mean, he's, he's personable and likable. He just doesn't want to talk about his background. Okay. The, so the he, sign at Sandpoint drops in your face. What do we see? What do you see? You see a six-foot, brown, brown-haired, blue-eyed, fair-skinned, uh, a little more fair than normal for a Talden. Uh, he's around 35 and uh, six foot and weighs about 190 pounds, wearing chain mail, a uh, long sword strapped to his side, a nice little dagger and a composite longbow. Looks like the longbow has seen lots of use. All right. He does not wear spurs on his boots. <laughs> no spurs, no mount. Just give him a good castle wall. That's right. right. Next, Winston, the portly. Winston the Portly, yeah. So what you see is, uh, uh, when you look down, is about a three-foot-tall, 100-pound uh, halfling wearing scale mail. Now, you guys... I'm sorry, did you uh, say 100 pounds? 100 pounds. He, like, pounds. bangs down the he's, hallway. He's, he's, <laughs> he's as round as he is tall. That is that is amazing. That, that's a <laughs> he has to wear dwarven armor. You're uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's not uh, only 100 pounds. And speaking of mounts, um, you guys don't see them right now, but you know of them due to my fame in the uh, in the barrel racing competitions of sport in the <laughs> arena. Um, I'm well known for my uh, unique mount. The athletic star I'm sensing from the PC guide. And uh, yes, Buckley is famous for this wolf that can stand on two legs. Barkley. Barkley, sorry. Stand on two legs and pick this halfling up by the feet and watch the halfling hands go like mad as they barrel race. Was that t- sorry? You did say no, no. Bar- it's barrel racing, but that you're thinking wheelbarrow race. Barrel racing is when oh, they sorry. put the, the three barrels in the arena and you have to do the the pattern around it. It's a race. Mm-hmm. Oh, like, like a time oh. trial. Yeah, sorry. Western barrel racing. Sorry, yes. you said barrel, and yeah, my brain went right to the shenanigans. Of and and the while I'm, you know, I'm not known for being some mighty jousting champion, I do hold the fastest time in all of civilized Tullador. Oh, very nice. A boast that is. And last but not least, bringing up the rear of this unusual party, Bartholomew. That's uh, Bartholomew Dunaldagon. A proud member of the Dagon family. At, um, I've been in military camp my whole life, though. Um, military I, man. What do you look like? I'm 6'5", 220 pounds, clad in armor from top to bottom, and with an assortment of weapons from a battle axe to a sword to a hunk of wood over my shoulder that to the unastute eye literally, literally looks like a stump. <laughs> okay. Anything else stand out about you, sir? Uh, other than the gun show? I was referring to your teeth. Oh, no, he's... It definitely is not fully human. His half-orc heritage definitely shows. He's got a uh, reddish... Well, hey, you can always hide right. it under a bucket helm. I'm just curious if it's apparent. Nope, no helmet. Proud about this. Okay. Uh, he's got, he has some tusks. Not big tusks. Um, it's, it's an obstacle I have to work over. It's but the okay, family yeah. will acknowledge me. Yeah, that's, that's fine. It's not the size of your tux. It's how you use your lance. No, or that's a good authority. Or club. <laughs> this is the guy with the short, short lance. Dude. All right. It Out- starts early. All yes. right. Outside, uh, Romeo is a gentleman and holds the door of his carriage for Tapo, who has no mount. I believe the rest of you all actually have your own personal mounts. Yes? Yes. All right, going back, first out of the door with Samish, can you describe your magnificent mount? Now, just a quick DM thing here. There's a lot of debate about what a cavalier gets, and they get a horse. 
if you get a large warhorse, that's an advanced template, and that's something that you kind of get into at the sort of third, fourth level. So mm-hmm. in a nutshell, there's the bestiary horse, ladies and gentlemen. Then they advanced template the sucker, and you get this massive draft horse or like a, you know a warhorse. It's amazing. But for a druid companion or aka the cavalier that gets one, your horses are kind of nerfed out of the gate. But by the time you guys hit second, third, fourth level, you are on par with a regular man's horse. And then after that, from that level on to 20th, look out, these horses will be doing your taxes, flying around the moon. It's really something. Could you describe and name your mount, Samish? Let's see here. Well, as soon as I step out of the, you know, out of the building and into the open, I'll whistle for Vicky. <whistles> Vicky! She and unties my... herself from the post and comes over. Oh, no, she's, she's not tied. She's wicked smart for a horse. Oh, okay. um, using the human, is it imperious? I believe, uh, allows me to put two extra points into an ability score of my choosing for my animal companion. So okay. I've chosen intelligence. So she's got a four int. Oh, sweet. So she like tied herself up to make the other horses like feel normal. And then I tied herself to show off at the end. Yeah, she's four mis- intelligence. Can she speak? She, she understands common. She understands it. Doesn't mean she can vocabulate it. No, she can't talk. Her accent is horrible, though. Oh, Just there's a spell for that. The movie, there is a spell. Doggo, right? Where he's like, all right, let's go. You know, like, anytime, buddy. And then the horse, like, right over. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. he talks, yeah, over. He, yeah, he talks to the horse. And the horse just, like, seems to understand. He can paw count complex equations. Does does algebra. Yeah, that's what it does your taxes in the dirt. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as, as Vicky kind of prances up, you know, I'll give her a quick brush. All right, girl. Looks like we're headed out. Are you done here? The horse looks around, gives me a quick nod. <laughs> Let, let's go. We can't hang around here all day. All right. And mounts up. And uh, Vicky's, like I was saying, is just a uh, the average, you know, as far as horses go. Um, let's see. I, I looked up some kind of base stats for horses. Uh, pretty burly. 16 strength, 4 ant, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, you know, 1,000 pound horse, about 15 hands tall. Uh, white with a gray mane. And one pale blue eye. The other one's brown. Because <laughs> that's not creepy. <laughs> that's right. That horse is looking at me. No? I've seen okay. such an animal, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So calling up the map here, gentlemen. Okay. We have an unmarked map of the capital city in Taldor of Opara. And the giant red square is the actual church where you were headed. Okay. You guys are, shall we say, um, across town. You know, general facility, parlor with a minor noble, bid you farewell, you know. And you guys are headed across town in Grand Procession following Alcasti's carriage. So, not wanting to be left behind, Leon, mounting your what? Mounting my Taldor Jennet. A, a sh- slightly shorter uh, horse, generally a very uh, slight, uh, slight of frame, but nevertheless packed of power. Um... Uh, the actual coloration, it's kind of a dark chocolatey brown with a kind of a red or kind of a pink scar going up over the eye and up behind the ear and down. Um, doesn't really know. It doesn't really show. Ob- it's not obvious like what caused that scar, but nevertheless, it's a f- very prominent feature of the face. He walks over. Uh, Mukage, time to go. And the horse similarly having actually not been tied up just kind of turns around and gets in gets into position for a mount and off i go does nobody tie up their horses anymore in this town okay fine <laughs> well-trained horses don't need it i know i just surprise your horse doesn't get stolen right <laughs> he's stealing my horse well he's small and he looks like he's burnt in the face it's fine i'm sure it would reject any rider that's not special and has taken such good care of it as you scars and all all <laughs> right so he is a boy horse anything else he is. about our mount um, as I was saying, he seems especially thin compared to like any other, most of the other horses around the area, but okay. not quite, not quite like pony level or anything. It's just like the Arabian but... horse in, in, um, 13th warrior, the Banderas road compared to like the giant horses. It's, he's just, you know, built for speed. Like yeah. That. Something like that. Okay. Uh, Tapo, you are enjoying the inside of a lavish carriage, but you can tell it's a rental. So it's oh. like one of those airport limos. It's nice. It's kept clean, but it's definitely used and probably not this man's personal belonging. He has probably shelled out some pretty coin to impress today. You know, well, it would have been impressive had it been his. Yes. <sighs> okay. We'll, we'll do fine. I'll just look out the window. And if it's a, if I see someone I recognize, I'll, I'll close it. 
<laughs> I don't want anyone to know I'm in involved. How long to airport? Okay. I'll, I'll be the anonymous one. That's right. fine with me. Next, we have Winston the Portly and his famous mount. So walking out of the uh, entrance of the noble's house, curled up beside the, the steps leading in, there's a um, medium-sized wolf just curled up in a little... What, what? Wild pup, animal? Pup, puppy ball. No, he's wearing a saddle. He's quite okay. tame, ignoring all the passersby completely, but it appears that way, but he's keeping a wary eye out. And he, you know, he steps down the stairs and... Gives little, tends to be a husky. Gives a little whistle and, and up jumps Barkley. My wow. uh, wolf <laughs> mount. Your wolf mount. All right. Yeah, it's not bark, bark, bark. It's woof, woof, grr. Uh, <laughs> it's a sli- sl- Slipping a foot into the stirrup, he kind of struggles to get himself up and onto the back of the saddle and just kind of looks over at Sir Bartholomew and says, <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. Uh, could I possibly trouble you for, for some assistance? What uh, do you need aid with? <laughs> He's struggling getting on his own bloody horse, as it were. And he just walks up to you and puts, it. He's puts not his hands up him. like a baby looking for a hug. <laughs> Barkley, Barkley is not leaning in on this at all. He stands as stiff. If anything, the wolf looks like he's on his tippy toes just to be a prick. Of course, companion. You can count on me. I pick him up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he gives a grunt as he lifts the bulk. Yeah, really. It's only a hundred pounds. Come on, that's heavy. Have you What's the armor? It's one hundred. Oh yeah, so like a hundred and probably sixty it's pounds. Like Thirty-five for the armor plus all your gear. You know, all your letters. A fifteen-year-old boy. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying Bartholomew's had experience with fifteen-year-old boys? Oh <laughs> no, not oh. crossing that line. I'm sorry, <laughs> I said it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't don't feed me. Stuff. Okay, don't don't put ideas in the GM's head because you know it just comes out in a horrible fashion. I mean, we all know you regret nothing. It's, yeah, <laughs> oh, I, I'm just warning. Fair warning. Regret Moral compass is just warning. spinning north south north south north there you, south. There you go. <laughs> all right. So plopping him on his little wolf, or sorry, his mighty wolf, his famous wolf. Yeah, the wolf's more famous than I am. Oh yeah, no, it's well going through town. If the wolf sees anybody he knows, you know, he's giving them winks and nods, and you know. Definitely draws attention in town. Yep. What coloring is the wolf? Grays and whites? Yeah, good standard wolf coloring. Okay. I was going to go for an Arctic wolf, but... Um, <laughs> nice big white target on there's, the field. There's <laughs> really no legit story way for me to have one of those. <laughs> and then I opened the crate that fell from the sky, and inside was an Arctic wolf. Yeah. Oh, that you. I raised as my I own. Do, I do appreciate that. Uh, I'm assuming Barkley oh. came from the big, huge, inside Taldorian border, Verdon Forest. Yes. We'll get to that. Sir Bartholomew, sending your companion on his way. Your mount. Is a uh, small uh, butternut draft horse. Okay. <laughs> like, I like an actual workhorse that you've to combat trained. Yes. <laughs> Used to pull the beer and I took him away from all that. Now he works for me. Oh, no, Graf. Awesome. All right. So an interesting party of Cavaliers. Yep. Yep. The ride, gentlemen is somewhat uneventful. However, as we pull around the proverbial corner... It's a random encounter. I've heard about these. This breathtaking view out to your left side of the hillock, which the church is mounted on, to the right is the city side. You guys have had to take a south turn. Now you're heading in a northerly direction. You're still like quite a few hundred meters from the coast and the cliff drop off into the actual inner sea and a magnificent view of the church on top of a hill. As you guys come around the bend, you see this blue domed and fluted spires of the Basilia of the Last Man rise from the skyline of Opera, the capital of Taldor that you all proudly call home or at least your favorite place to visit. The Belissa rests atop a tall hill whose rolling grass-covered slopes are free of the usual bustle of city life much like a park that, you know, people just don't really want to disturb and maybe have a little luncheon and then sneak away. A carriage approaches the symbol of a Pegasus on its door and resting at the foot of the hill. Out of it, Tapo and Romeo Alcasti thank the driver and send him on his way. It is noted by all that the driver reminds Alcasti to take his pennant 
the symbol of the Pegasus, which is more draped like a banner over the side of the window. So if you had any qualms about if this was sort of a rental for the day, it is assured now that, you know, his gold pieces have run out and he sort of (laughs) tucks that up and rolls it away while the rest of you slowly ride up and sort of catch up to the carriage. With a bow, thank you all for coming. We're here to check on the bust I mentioned earlier and in my note. And if we can, convince Brother Velikus to let us move it to a safer location. The gods know I've tried, but he just won't listen to reason. Frank, I need you to feed me my own voice again, because I, I actually decided that, you know, whoever read the letter, that's the voice I would go with. And I've already lost it. Oh, you're you're super screwed. I forgot how I read it. That's okay. That's <laughs> um, okay. okay. Any questions, gentlemen? As, you know, as Alcasti turns on his heel and marches up to the church itself, any last minute preparation, any questions for the GM? Ah, oh, where would we find the stables? Uh, this church stands alone on a hill. Your smart horses will have to remain untied and well-behaved on their own somewhere. Do I have to get off my horse or my wolf? Uh, a wolf inside a church? Knowledge local? That's an ill omen. <laughs> uh, Lord uh, Gildervarth doesn't seem very impressed that you haven't dismounted and like keeping stride with them as we head up the hill. Seems like a bad idea to me. Yeah. Never heard of it happening before. <laughs> With that mighty nine in knowledge local. Maybe if you win a couple more barrel races, you know, uh, you're pretty sure that society dictates this is a bad idea. Mounts are well respected, but they go where they go. For okay. like, like good friends, not so much. Now, if you're some powerful archmage that had some little parrot on your shoulder, I'm sure they might overlook. But, you know, four paws on the church floor, probably frowned upon. But that's not stopping you. I'm not stopping you. I'm just saying. Yeah, I won't. I'll dismount with everybody else. Okay. And he immediately falls behind. Not just because of his halfling movement. (laughs) No, totally because of my halfling movement. (laughs) Like 20 feet plus the... Not to mention it takes me twice as long to get off my mount. No, that's okay. Actually, um, Barkley will like get behind you with his head down and push you along. You know, just so he can keep pace. He'll stop at the door. (laughs) Then then he'll round up all the sheep. I mean, horses and make them parallel park on that sort of strange left-handed 45 degree angle. With their noses along the wall of the church. Yeah. Barkley takes me up to the edge of the steps so I can literally just step off. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. He'll just carry you right up there and then just sort of stop at the steps so you just kind of walk off the front level with the ground. Anyone else? I'll dismount off of Vicky and kind of grab her by the, the chin and give her a quick scratch. All right, keep an eye out. All right. And then move on. And, and Vicky, because she doesn't have like any kind of guard or any kind of tricks like that, just kind of starts gnawing at grass and slowly wanders off but doesn't go too far okay yeah there's lots of uh <laughs> lots to keep them busy out here i mean there's each other some are boy horses some are girl horses there's you know there's no bustle of the city it's all open air breeze grass you know that's a really good spot for them to hang out i don't think they're fuss at all right which, get, which gets us back to the actual play podcast church <laughs> the actual church anyone have knowledge religion not often I call for these roles out loud, but you know what? No, sir. I do not. No, no sir. Do not. All right. And we make them untrained. <laughs> well, yes. I can tell you what a DC 10 or lower, which is common knowledge for any untrained. I will take a 10. All right. So one by one, you guys kind of sort of come up the steps and take in the grandeur, which is the church, remembering facts about the god Arden, the human that ascended, the great champion. I've heard of him. Up then finally died, and now his church and faith are sort of in decline. But he was a big part of Taladian history, so the church remains. Entering inside. Mm. Wondering why you're hesitating. Alcasti actually comes back out, waves you in. It's okay. Come come with me, gentlemen. After my lordships, as I hold my hand out, (laughs) stand by the door waiting for everyone to usher in. Thank you, Tapo. Thank you. I'll... uh... (laughs) I'll, I'll, place. <laughs> I'll, I'll move on in. The uh, the craftsmanship at the Church of Aradin is quite spectacular. I apologize for tarrying too long, but it's not often I make it to this side of town. Yes. Come on, Captain. Turning uh, turning to uh, Bartholomew. Come on, Captain. We don't always get... People like us don't get in here very often. No, I was just taking in the grandeur. That's a lot of stone. Yeah. What do you think you could do with that? It's I bet you, you could build at least like five houses with that. Oh, no doubt. Oh, one really big wall. This looks very fortifiable. Looks like I could defend this well. Yeah, 
actually this this is some solid stonework as far as you can tell now it's not exactly right, the upper the parapets is... aren't exactly meant for like you know the man to stand upon it certainly is quite the death zone surrounding the uh, surrounding the chapel hinting yeah, at your, like nodding at your bow yes <laughs> the archers are just like yeah we just set up camp here and i'm already marking my targets <laughs> There's nobody here but you guys. Like just, I said. <laughs> just <creepy. laughs> All right. That's that's really creepy. All right. Um, well, soldiers are, they have that air of menace around them. Yes. You always got to be ready for combat. Yeah. No, that's fine. And as you are sort of making observations and getting to know one another, I am taking liberal use of the macros I've made in roll 20 and spamming some whisper rolls to myself. Now, the first thing you guys go in, you're overwhelmed, vaulted ceilings, you know, but everyone does notice the sort of, you know, uh, scent of dust. I mean, it's cleaned, but you, you know, and there's some of the side little pews and offshoot rooms and the faded of the crimson drapes, you know, like this is, this church isn't getting a lot of money and a lot of, you know, passing the hat of late. It's, uh, it's not fallen into ruin and it does not look in disrepair. Far from it. There's enough generation generations of of um, generosity still believing in this church and the building itself to keep its maintenance up but there's certainly no lackluster or grandeur or you know that sort of thing going on here tapo and sir winston you yeah. two actually notice that there are paintings and tools missing off of prominent places in the wall there should be, you know, painting, painting, gap, painting, painting. Hey, wait a minute. Shouldn't there be a painting there? You can kind of just make out the fade on the, the stone discoloration. Um, there's a couple of, shall we say, holy acraments and tools that are on prominent dis- display. And some of the lower ones, like there's a couple of missing rungs and racks that seem to be empty. This catches your notice as you guys. I mutter something about, hmm, it looks like uh, they've been selling things to make making lack of tithes. <laughs> making the mortgage payments. Yes. Again, sort of drifting off ahead of you guys as you guys sort of um, tour guide your way in here with Samish at the lead. Romeo disappears into the back end of the church and reappears, dragging a man in simple robes. And he introduces him as Father Velikus. A great amount of trepidation, gentlemen, you all notice is on his face. Romeo doesn't seem to notice it. It's like, oh, I got him, you know convincing him dragging him out to you guys saying hey this is the guy i want you to meet my friends you know and you guys notice um father velikus sort of um pressing his thumbs against his forefinger and looking around nervously even so much as whipping a little hanky and dabbing his brow before he gets within that 30 feet that you'd notice to present himself to you i say father velikus is everything all right you seem a bit distraught uh um actually now now Romeo cuts in. Um, no stalling. I have come to petition you once more for the rightful property of my ancestor. You know I'm the rightful heir, and soon enough, with these great gentlemen's help, I shall prove it once and for all. Please, can you not do your part and acquiesce those items to me? And as, as if that's your cue, he steps aside and sort of, with a sweeping motion, you know, Big grin, you know, doing the S nod, hoping you guys are going to jump in there. It's it's downright shameful. <laughs> Just sort of like paying you guys to, you know. So Sa- Samish will kind of shrug and step forward. All right, if if, if I'm here to to sell us a, a point of view, I guess so be it. Um, Father Vickers, can you can you tell me about this bust that we are to to look at? It, it seems that perhaps this is not the best place for it, giving, and he'll look around, noting the missing portraits that were pointed out to him, given the uh, current level of patronage. Um, well, I, um, you know, the priest sort of stammers and and rubs the back of his neck and looks around nervously, and uh, as if misunderstanding and taking that your cue isn't enough. Um, can I have a diplomacy check from you, sir? And does anyone else wish to jump in and aid? With, which, you know, really should be a very simple... I'm here for when diplomacy fails. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, up to two, up I'll, to two I'll throw down on, I'll yeah. throw down on that. Uh, uh-huh. as well. All right. So both Leon and Bartholomew step forward. And our current patron can clearly afford proper protection. Rolling diplomacy 16. Okay. Ooh. I got a 13. Uh, 14, 15 with the aid. Okay. 
Uh, each guy will give you an additional plus two when they pop ten. What'd you get there, Ryan? So uh, seventeen. One gave his line. The other guy gave the dice roll. I need you guys to go back and yeah, <laughs> no, his so, line. And uh, yes, I got a thirteen. All right, so I believe that gives me a total of plus uh, seventeen. Yes, yes, it does. So I mean, like I, in the corner. I mean, after all, it would be most unfortunate, say, if uh, s- certain items would come up missing that may reflect quite negatively on the Church of Arrowden. Are you sure you wish to hold on to something like this? You know, trying to okay leverage their um, financial insecurities. He, Father finally cracks under the sort of um, row of men all just kind of nudging him and says, well, actually, it, it's gone missing. And he just, <laughs> just stands there wringing his hands. Gone missing. This admission infuriates Romero, and he immediately gets in the father's face, and he's like, what? And begins shouting. I stand and pull my sword, ready for action. Now, Sir Sir Romero, I'm sure we can figure out where it went. I mean, just because it's missing doesn't mean it was, like, sold off. So you're trying to calm him down? Yeah. Do you wish me to run this man through? (laughs) <laughs> Killing a priest in his place of worship is m- very poor taste. Yeah, I heard but, that. Can I have a diplomacy check at negative two because Tapo is certainly not helping? <laughs> I'm trying to intimidate. Oh, okay. You're doing your own thing. I'm intimidate doing, to do what? To have him cow before me. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's Kneel old. before Zod. All right. No, I'm actually, what I'm trying to do is uh, back up Romario. I'm trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, no, I know I got it. Like, Romario is furious and Tapo is jumping in there going, you know, so that's fine. Yeah. Completely different sort of agenda going here, but sure, let's yes. have it intimidate away. Uh, okay. But get it, starting off with Leon here. Yeah, Leon first. Uh, diplomacy of 11. Okay. <laughs> Tapo's intimidate. 23. <laughs> okay. My sword gleams, the edge sharp. <sighs> It somehow has found itself within an inch of its eye, his eye. All right. Um, Cough up. Fa- father, who might, who father, might be in trouble here? Uh, <laughs> father Felicus pales at Ta- Tapo's you know, obvious implications of what will happen to him if he can't magically produce this thing that's gone missing and takes a step back, waving his hands up and says, I, I'm so sorry, Romero. Uh, I mean, Lord, Cassidy, I, I should have listened to it's just you know there was no need it's been here for so long and i have besides yourself there has been no interest in it and you're the only one that actually connected it to any uh former nobility even of your own name i'm i'm so terribly sorry anyway and he seems you know sufficiently cowed now while this is going on leon does manage to plant a firm hand on romero's shoulder and pull him back a step as well and calm the man down but now tapo has taken up <laughs> you know, so we have um, and seeing uh, just, seeing Tapo yeah. draw his sword. So Winston <laughs> walks up beside him, reaches up and puts his hand on his gauntlet and says, show some respect. Good man. We're in a place of worship here. I am showing the proper respect. He did not honor Romario's request of guarding it properly. He should pay where where could have this gone? Who could have taken it? Okay. Romario takes a dramatic deep breath and then ex- he explains, well, let's at least hear the man. All out. right, fine. Shink. All right. Valicious, <sighs> with a great big sigh of relief, explains that he only left the relics unattended for a few minutes. Um, and several metallic <laughs> relics, including the bus, were gone when I get back. And he sort of like waves off to the side as if showing you the side of the room where this stuff was displayed or kept. What do you guys want to do? It was kept there in that room. Yeah, in a little side room. Can we go look? Yep, he's he's sort of gesturing as if you guys, you know. Sir Winston goes and looks at the places that are emptied and spends like a like takes his time and really examines them to look for signs of like stuff being reefed away or any. All right. Now I know what you're saying. Sorry, I know what you're thinking. We were hired by a noble, Hal Three Musketeer. We travel to a church. Awesome. We're on the way to the political reign. You know, the church always has great big pull in the political arena of a medieval world. And now, suddenly, we've been shafted into a Scooby-Doo mystery. But hey, what can you do? So, gentlemen, going around the room, starting left to right, just we'll go on the order of um, the roll 20 here. Samish being the lead on this one. 
Well, as the others kind of go and explore the ruin, I'm going to stop and talk with uh, Father Vicus. Kind of do two things at once. Kind of sorry, Vilicus. Uh, <laughs> We're Vilicus. Just butchering this. Uh, we are just murdering this guy's poor name. Yeah. Um, kind of laying his fears at ease, but then trying to get a little more information from him. Okay. Um, well, since he, since the effects of Tapo's in- intimidation are still in play, this is difficult in its current setting. You might want to get him away from the angry noble and his new guard dog. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and that's well, what I mean. As the others... He'll answer, he'll answer anything you want you ask. Just ask him. I'll make sure. Yeah, that's true. true. <laughs> Tapo asks him, he'll cough up anything you want to know. I grab his the, the, the scruff of his shirt, pull him a little closer, answer his questions. Yes, yes, of course. And I'll set my hand on Tapos. Now, now, I, I believe your skills would be most useful over there, investigating where the crime took place. Let me talk to the kind priest here, and we'll get to the bottom of this eventually. Hmm. Now, now, Father. I let him go. C- come with me, okay. please. Romero is actually enjoying his anger as being played out by one of his new subordinates. So Romero doesn't do anything to affect the situation. He's just happily nodding at Tapo like, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, the man's done us wrong, you know. That's right. That's right. You know, kind of a saying this guy's fears. Um, so please talk to me. Who else knows that the bust was here or that it was out of any value? I mean, obviously, this is a place of worship and people go in and out. But how many actually pay attention to the objects you want? Um, sort of, again, taking the sidestep, really trying hard not to let Romero hear. He leans into you and he says, actually, um, the only thing I can uh, think of, good sir, is the fact that we do have the odd worshiper and some attendants around, you know, all have been checked out and have worked for the church, volunteers and, you know, minor clergy. Um, they all have vows of poverty. You know, he, he goes through the list and assures you that, you mm-hmm. know, staff is not a problem. Um, but then he says, um, Romeo, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Acasti has visited me often and frequently of late and has made a big show and it's been quite loud. And if there was anyone visiting the church, um, may think that since our Lord's in decline and not worth, do you understand what I'm saying? I understand. I understand. You know, like that, you know, the herd might be tempted going, you know, I'm still paying lip service to this dead God. And, uh, <laughs> valuable bust you say hmm that kind of thing anyway that's the father's father Villicus's best theory at this time okay so nobody in his opinion seems like like a first timer you know and everybody that comes to pay worship is a familiar face they come regularly and things like that nobody knew yes okay can I use my survival skills to look for any tracks or any signs left behind by whoever might have taken them? Yes, you may, sir. You head into the room where he had pointed out they were kept. Survival away. Survival of 12? Survival of 12. You do find that there's been some extra traffic, but you can't really identify if it's staff or, you know, like the proverbial thief or whatever. It's one of those things is like, am I looking at tracks or am I just really looking at wear and tear? With a 12, you're just not sure. Okay. Now, gentlemen, you are a party of Cavaliers and your skill set is pretty bare bones. So if anyone has a duplicate skill from this point on and wants to jump in, you know, aid another, aid another to boost his skills, like you guys did last time, by all means, but I'm this is the last time I'm going to ask. Yep. And uh, um, I I'm, get... I'm quite well suited for aiding another. Um, I give a plus four bonus rather than a plus two bonus based on my uh, halfling talent helpful. Yes. Okay. I've now, always considered halflings to be quite helpful. Give me of, a beer. <laughs> part of the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just laughing because I actually, I, I know Frank has got a craft beer in his hand. I just know it. <laughs> what, what are you drinking, Frank? I, I do indeed. I am what? currently drinking Ace Pineapple Craft Cider. Oh, very nice. Let's try that. <laughs> A product of California. Do they Insert make certain product placement here? Yeah. Thank you, California. Well, half our crew is Canadian, <laughs> the other half is American. So I'm just curious: can we get that good old, that good sweet ambrosia up here, or no? Uh, I can ship one to you as far as the border. I don't know what it looks like going across borders. Have a long yeah. way to go for so, a drink. So I'll meet you. I'll meet you in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. All right. So just chuck it across Niagara Falls to us. 
<laughs> I'm open. Yeah, this is where we regret having the nice side of the falls with the big basin where you're just, you know, on the catching side of a beer that's coming across. It's, oh, uh, we'll never make that reach. <laughs> Some guy in the little rainbow warrior down there on the bottom gets conked on the head. One less yellow jumpsuit wearing coat gets just falls over the side, but, you know, blink. A victim of Frank's throw. So, but we digress. Yes, there's there's something here. You just can't seem to make heads or tails of it. So um, I'm going to say, can we aid another for survival checks? Or do we have to be trained? That's a good question. Hey, you uh, have to be trained in survival to make a survival check. And if I, you if you have the time to really pay attention, meaning take a twenty, yeah. about how long? I mean, do we have that much time? Oh, it yeah, take, 20, it take takes 20, an two hour, two minutes, uh, for survival check. Oh, does it? Uh, okay, yeah. Are you I, talking about like foraging? Um, well, that's like if we go out into the wilderness and I want to like figure out the best route to get somebody somewhere and take my time to do so to make sure it's safe or whatever, it takes me an hour. And and if the terrain's not familiar, it's two hours. Well, I can tell you this. You guys, any non-train can burn a move action to make a perception check to find tracks, but you can't follow them. And you can't really make heads or hair of what they are. The survivalist can say, oh, it's this type of creature, I believe, or this kind of footprint, and he can follow them outside the area. But anyone untrained can make perception checks and go, that's a track. You know, that's a big dinosaur foot, you know, that kind of thing. But can't make heads That's or tails a- of like the creature or, you know, where it's going or follow the trail. You know, they instantly lose it. That much I can give you out of the book. So perceptions all around, gentlemen. Oh, I was going to say oh, I could sure. aid survival. Oh, you can? Do you actually have it? Yeah. A dra- uh, it's an order of the dragon. All right. Well, aid I'm- me, sir. Aid me. What is it you're trying to do there? All right. Trying since- to track. Let me show you how to track. Since we're out of the gate, I will let you retcon this. But I'm telling you, my generosity is going to dry up really quick, guys. No 18. worries. Boosting him to 14. But still. Could he uh, aid me instead? Bartholomew. <laughs> oh, no, I declared first. Bartholomew. Uh, yeah, leave the room for an hour. Come back. And after they've swept up the room and make, look for fresh tracks. Uh, you guys are all standing around making new tracks. That's the best part. We all enter the room and we're all bustling around and we all, oh, we find tracks. Really, sir? Yes. A, a tiny halfling has tripped. Start walking in a circle. I yeah. know. This is what I'm picturing. You guys are in this little room going, we look for tracks, you know. We haven't done that CSI part of the Cavalier training where you guys get to a doorway and go, don't want to touch anything, you know, and one guy steps in. You guys, like, oh, three guys went in here all looking around and then one guy goes, hey, while I'm in here, do I see? Why, yes, you do. Three sets of tracks, actually. So if that's the case, and actually like to try to perceive if um, where the bust used to be and see if there's like a piece of ripped off cloth on the mantle or uh, oh, any other evidence of theft or disable or yes, sure. I look for clues. Look for clues. This really is getting Scooby-Doo, isn't it? We didn't split right. up yet. 17. Uh, this is an excellent, excellent train of thought that can aid you elsewhere and in other parts of the venture, gentlemen, I will tell you this, but right here at this point in time, you're coming up now. Nah. But I do uh, like your thinking nah, 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 and don't nah. give up in the future. And I'll, and after taking a look at where it was and not really gleaming anything of use, I'll go over to the priest and kind of take him aside and, uh, good sir, is there anyone who would, who would wish ill will upon this fair establishment? Uh, looking sideways at Romero, <laughs> not well there's enemies of the church of course but I, uh, I don't think so I believe specifically we're thinking of the family anyone come to mind that um, that would be capable of such a brazen act no 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 like, like I said like, there's there's just the just the staff maintain these rooms and it's the the staff that in my opinion you know check out and well let's let's verify that bring him in here who was the first person to notice this, the bust was missing um, well, um, Brother Davros, actually. That dweeb from Sandpoint? The very same. Isn't so he on he, the run? He he goes <laughs> and... Uh, they call you know, it the lamb. He, he goes and gets the closest loitering staff member and asks him to fetch Brother Davros. And oh, a Davros. Sh- very short time later, <laughs> a young half-elf appears with sandy blonde hair and is adorned in... Uh, sort of acolyte, like, you know, brand new convert to the faith kind of thing. He's wearing the penance robes. Maybe he's either giving up a former faith. I don't know, maybe Saren Ray or something. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he's looking to convert to a dead god, you know. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Bill has the sand on his pointed shoes. So, um, 
muttering to himself, coming out, Father Vilkis, you know, these men, explains the situation. We form the circle of interrogation. Yes. How about a circle of diplomacy, intimidation, bluff, and all the usual social skills? At the <laughs> same time. What? I'll wait until diplomacy fails. Okay. So, what are we leading? What skill are we leading here with, gentlemen? Diplomacy. Diplomacy. Right. Who's our lead? Um, One lead, two aid. I'll Last take time, you guys are lead. professional players. You've been playing I'll, for years. You know this stuff. I'll aid. <clears throat> All right. I have a plus six, uh, so but I'll aid. Okay. Because it's a good aid for me. All right. Lead roller, player, please. I roll. I got a 14. All right. Woo-hoo! Let's have the spiel there. How do you uh, how do you approach this gentleman? You guys are a half circle of all differing differing views. We have the angry side, Alcasti and Tapo, to the sympathetic side, Samish, and the matter of fact side of you guys playing Capo in the middle here. So we're playing good night, bad night. That's you guys right. are sort of a uh, black, white, and gray mix. It's kind of confusing to approach you guys at once. Um, Brother Davros, we heard that you were the last one to actually see this. Uh, Object that's gone missing. I was hoping you might be able to uh, tell us what you saw or didn't see when you. He didn't. he asks you what everybody rolled. You got fourteen. Uh, Winston fails with an eight because you need ten I, for the aid. Yep, I succeeded with a twenty-one. So that brings us up to sixteen. I also succeeded on a diplomacy uh, to aid. Yes, that would bring him up to sixteen. Okay. Um, I um uh, I was polishing the pews. And um, when I finished, <laughs> says, uh, I went to clean the rooms in the side, and I then it was then I noticed that it was empty, gone. Yeah, and looking sense at Father motive. Vilkis to like be let go. You know, can I go now? <laughs> you can sense motive untrained, right? Uh, yep. Yeah, everyone actually, can sense motive honestly, guys, you can call for it, or if it's you know if. If an NPC starts bluffing and I'm doing those roles, I'm automatically doing sense okay. mode for you guys. Okay. Oh, okay. But instead of like going, hmm, sometimes I might go, hmm, you know, hey there, Tapo, he seems to be lying. Sometimes Got if it. it's kind of obvious to everyone in character, I'll just have them act really, really hesitant and shifty. Right. As well, opposed that's to cool. Like, that's you know. what I exactly thought you were doing. Yeah. Okay. So basically, oh, if, it, if it's oh, like okay. one or two guys make the roll, I'll point it out to those two guys. But if like everyone's kind of on to the sense motive, I'll just role play the guy as a schmuck. Okay. okay. Oh, that's so we're all getting the sense then that he's something uh, is not right. Leave, yeah, leaving stuff out, being evasive. I um, hoist him up off his feet. <laughs> you're going to tell me exactly what it is you know. Okay. He gets wide-eyed, doesn't wiggle. And then annoyedly looks to his left shoulder and says, no, no, it, it, it's fine, dear. I, I, I got this. And he looks back at you and he says, okay, okay, there's, there's no need for hostilities. The hostilities haven't even begun yet, friend. <laughs> he calls, he mumbles a name at you you do not recognize. Maybe he knows another half-orc. Just put if me only, down. If only earlier were here. <laughs> Just put me down. And so I'd like to imitate of 17. Okay. Is anyone backing him up on this? Oh, yes. If I can. Yeah, go ahead. I'll always, I'll always attempt. Yeah, I, I suggest that if anyone oh. has an idea to use any skill, that two guys just lean in and go, and we help. You know, this yep. free plus four. You know, I'm you know. successful. Aha. A dagger has appeared in my hand and pointing. To press I'm, against I'm, aid, I'm aiding as well. Okay. I fold my arms across my chest and look all intimidating. Oh, all stand stand, stand on his toes. Stand on his toes. Oh, so. <laughs> So as so as one person like a blowfish, <laughs> as one person stands on his toes and another's trying to hoist him up, and a third's trying to press a knife to his neck, back, back, please, I, please, I've, I've brother, brother Defos, I've he puts his hands up and just takes a step back, shaking. I've encountered the demons Ouch. of Sandpoint and the Goblin raids, but he says, but nothing as crazy as this. Father Vilkas, he just kind of looks at him. Anyway, this anyway, Father Vilkas comes over and puts a hand on him. Like they're there, like this guy is some kind of victim. You know what I mean? Like he, we don't we don't pull him out much. You know, the guy's been through a lot, seen terrible things, and maybe had some kind of breakdown. And you know, took all his courage to like puff up and come out here. And then you guys just start shaking him around to it ate him. So he just starts losing it. You know, just kind of uh, turtles up as it were. Anyway, Vilkas jumps in, kind of assures him, no, it's okay. You know, you, you know. Just tell the men what they want to know, and then they'll leave. And we can go back to, you know, cleaning 
you know, the, the chores. The mahogany. That's right. Go back to the chore, the rhythmic cleaning, remember? And he's making this wax on, wax off. And, and the half elf's head's bobbing in unison to the, the motion going, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, actually. Cleaning the scepters. Yeah. Yes. Cleaning the scepters. It's, it's, it's yes. soothing. He's an altar boy. <laughs> a lot of kneeling and if praying. If you'd like to see more of my uh, unstable halfling cleric, <laughs> listen to Clinton Score Classics playing Rise of the Rune Lords Anniversary Edition. Okay, we're done with that cameo. Okay. So, <clears throat> former. Former. Sorry, I had to leave the show. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Amongst the distraction of noises and gentlemen all talking over each other and everything he finally father vilkas finally kinds of straighten this poor man up and assures him it's okay you know this is a safe place you can tell the gentleman what you saw so he guiltily admits to vilkas sort of like tells vilkas his friend is in front of you guys as opposed to like looking at you guys making eye contact i um was supposed to be polishing the ballista's pews but i decided to lie down for a nap and I was just falling asleep when I saw a hunched over and he kind of searches for the word and then looks at Sir Portly and says, halfling sized humanoid running through the halls. This sized? Sized like this? And I point to uh, Sir Sir Portly. Yes, yes. Not much bigger than him. You mean Uh, as big as him? Yes. Well, hunched down. Really? He's the one? No. No. With a look of surprise and shock on my on, on my face. I, I are you saying this is the one? I, and I'm I don't, pointing. I don't know. <laughs> he becomes I, I confused. Think, <laughs> I think if it, if it was so portly, he would have had different adjectives to use to describe the thing he witnessed. Mm, I'm confused. He says so, it's so him, so but it's not him. Elf that you keep <laughs> jumping on every time he gets almost tells you something useful. Um. Anyway, gentlemen, well, of course. Can I have perception yeah. all around? Not Tapo, who's jumping the gun. Everyone yes, but Tapo, course. give me a perception check. Tapo's all up and busy in his room. You, you get the glint of, he doesn't put two and two together very well. Ooh, Ooh perception he, of 20. Man of action. I get it. Men of action. <laughs> deals with what's in face, you know. um, That's right. You guys did notice that he did gesture Ooh. in a random direction that has nowhere near, you know, where you've been or when he was describing, you know, I saw him hunched and run through the halls and he distinctly did gesture off in a single direction before Tapo two? got up on him and just confused the hell out of him. Which, okay. That That's hall. what you guys get for your perception. Oh. <clears throat> he went that way. Hmm. Does he mean literally? I asked the rest of the group. I believe he's telling the truth. Well, which direction did he point? I wasn't paying attention. Yes, and bringing it up is practically meta. Gentlemen, what do you do? Um, set him down, dust him off. <laughs> I thought you put him down the last time. I've been saying this entire thing up in the air. Yes. Okay. okay, no wonder I'm so rattled. All right. Well, so partly, shall we go for a walk? Splendid we- idea, good chap. Splendid idea. We might as well have a gander that way. Oh, hey, there I he is. Don't <laughs> mind if I join. I think I'll watch this one. And I point at Brother Davros. Don't, don't be shy, good. Samus. You're the, the holiest of us all. Oh, no, I accidentally closed my uh, uh, roll 20 account. (laughs) (laughs) I'm blind. I'm I'm flying blind. Savage has these fits of blindness. All right. Okay, so uh, so I'll I'll take uh, Brother Davros, you you know, and and turn. You haven't been taking the Taldor pod challenge, have you? And, you know, blindness. Yeah, blindness. Uh, Eyes closed, Brother Davros in hand, and we begin to walk that way down the hall. Now, okay. you must be exhausted from pew polishing, but please humor me a moment, if you will. Have you seen a halfling like this before? <laughs> he giggles and goes with you. Pew <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, he points in the direction, and you guys get to a wall, and there's a stairwell and a door at the bottom of a, a short flight of stairs. This Father sta- Velikas, uh basically explains... Oh, you know, kind of filling in because the man is still still kind of holding your hand abashedly, talking to someone that isn't there off of his left shoulder. So Vilkis kind of um, <clears throat> covers up for his acolyte and steps in with you guys and says, "Oh, this um, le- this leads to the catacombs actually beneath the church." And now, who would have knowledge of these catacombs, and and who would have authorization or permissions to move freely from there to here? Uh, well, really, only myself as the caretaker has the key. Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. All right. Finally frustrated, 
at the length of this uh, proceeding, Romero steps forward and demands the key from Valkus and says, The game is afoot. Oh, I rather like the sound of that. Can I? And he looks at you guys all shaking your heads. Oh, never mind. Let's get to the bottom of this. And he demands the key from Valkus, who pats himself down and produces it. Hands it to Alkalsti, who immediately hands it to Samish. <laughs> he says he'll go, but he's not going to lead. I'll take the key. Okay. Move it, in, move it uh, up towards the gate and unlock it. Okay. Turn back towards my companions. Shall we? And, and uh, Sir Winston turns to um, turns to the, what was the guy's name? The priest? Vivicus? Vilicus. Vilicus. Turns to him and says, um, Excuse me, sir. There's, there's one more thing I would like to try before we enter the, the, the catacombs here. Um, my companion outside has a, a, a quite unique ability when it comes to, um, to tracking things down. If you wouldn't mind, uh, I would like permission to bring my mount into your church. You wish to bring your horse in here? Oh, oh no, sir. No, sir. Barkley's no horse. <laughs> um Romeo starts waving at the priest, like nodding, like, you know, it's okay. The gentlemanly company assures him that, you know, this is good. This is fine. So they agree. So Sir Winston runs outside, gives a whistle for Barkley to come to the stairs so he can climb on with as much ease as possible. Okay. And then he, you know, cautiously rides uh, Sir Barkley into the church. And I'm going to throw out a ride check for you there. All right. Gentlemen. If forming, I can. Up, forming up behind Samish at the door. Sir Samish, the key turns quite easily for Father Velkus's claims of ill use and petty use and not often used. The door swings open with a low groan, revealing a very, very, very dark hall, which is a continuation of the same stairway down into a stone and musty depths. Marching order, gentlemen, only five foot wide stairway, and you are effectively blind. There is no light down here. Uh, I can see. Except for the half-orc. Well, mm. I think the half-orc should go first, then. I walk in. Of course I should go first. I'm the bravest one here. Before Sir Winston goes towards the stairwell, he takes Barkley into the room where the bust was and has him sniff around to see if he can pick up any scents. Okay. Uh, the wolf has survival? Scent and survival, yes. Um, okay. And he gets a bonus. Can you roll right off of his sheet? Because it should, should be a just, dice icon. I'm just checking to see if I can. You should be able to. Um, now, if not, you can just tell me the bonus and, you know, controlling. So it's it's a, um, normally it's a one, but because he's tracking by scent, he gets a plus four. So he's a plus five to his survival check. Okay. Now, these mounts, like Druid abil- uh, Cannel Companions, are specifically bonded to you guys. So just to bring this up, uh, one quick moment for our studio audience. What this entails is they are s- practically like there's a supernatural, practically magical bond between these gentlemen and their mount of choice. They can sense each other. It's, it's sort of empathic. And it will grow, and there will be all kinds of powers added but it's not just a, a training thing where like, good boy, and we spent all this time and I raised you from a pup. There's a, a palatable connection between each cavalier and his mount. So Some may call it an empathic link. Exactly. I will allow you to roll the skills for your own mounts, gentlemen, so go right ahead. I can't roll it off the page, so I'll just do a raw one using sure. the roller. 1d20 plus 5. Okay. So who's falling in behind? Well, he's off for having a sniff, and the half-orc's head for the stairs. Oh, who's falling in behind? Nope. Anybody lighting up Six. torches? I, no. I call ahead, and I say, Halfling, be helpful. Light a torch. I need both hands to wield this bow. Okay. I'd like to follow in behind uh, Bartholomew, if that's okay. No problem. Okay. And uh, Halfling has actually gone off to the other side of the church. So Halfling! Gonna... Halfling! Tapolo is delaying. Uh, yes. Which I'll, leaves Samish I'll spark up. Yeah, I'll spark up a torch since I can't see in. Excellent. Someone has some sense. <clears throat> All right. Now, quickly, Oak, move in and explore for us. Who? <laughs> I believe he's oh. talking to the captain here. You do know I have a name, right? Of course you do. Human. But that's, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Excuse me. That's Lord Gildevath to you. <laughs> right, human. Okay. 
<laughs> you may call me your liege, your lordship, any of those will do, but human will get you, I don't know, the bowman there could take care <laughs> of it quite hard. easily. <laughs> You're a stern talking to. All right. The bowman Wrong, can barely better. see. You're the only target he can see. All right. So just to get this straight, passing by Samish, the head of the pack, is our half-orc cavalier Bartholomew, followed by the quasi-Asian, orphan-raised samurai with a bow, uh, Hakiro, what's your name? <laughs> I want to say Setsuna, but you changed it at the last minute. Akihiko. Akiko, but we just call you Leon. Yeah, just, just call me Leon. Okay, then we have Lord Guild of Arth, the mightiest of us, the truest of us all, followed by the ever skeptical Tapo, also with bow, and bringing up the rear from dallying, we have Romeo and our mounted, tracking, smelling, sniffing everything, supportly. And I shall take us to the scene, as it were. Slowly the world comes into focus. Slowly the world comes into focus. Now, I have taken the liberty of doing a little bit of ambient lighting, uh, sort of um, Diablo style, where you get a sense of rooms and places around just from knowing how much building and flat space is above you and how big the rooms could be. But coming down the stairway, another 15, 20-ish feet, a sharp left. So now we are entering the map in its center from left to right, facing east, starting with Bartholomew. You come to a the first room, shall we say. Can I have perception all around? Do keep in mind, gentlemen, that for every 10-foot distance you are from something making noise or visible, if you even have line of sight, there is a negative one penalty that stacks and I'll be applying them, keeping eyes on where your minis stand. So someone at the back rolling high could actually do crappier than someone at the front rolling low, if that makes sense to you. I hope it does. I believe it does. <clears throat> I believe it does. I believe, I believe. So Samish pauses for a moment as soon as we kind of move down and kind of lifts his ear up and gets a 19. Okay. On the way down, the three things you notice is the dampness, the heavy solid stone cut fixture that is around you making up this place and the imposing decorate decorated winged eye of Arodin, which was on the back of the rotting door that we came through and several other deteriorating doors in a single wedge shaped room so if you guys were literally to step out of this hallway into the room and sort of place hands flat on the walls beside you this wall is straight and then going east there is a door to your right and to your left. And then coming to the back wall, the, the back wall is actually angled in, funneling to the rear wall, which appears to have a double door at it. Barely visible from the torchlight of Sir Gildemarsh. So, sorry, Gildemarsh. Gildervarth. Sorry, my lord. <clears throat> the um, staircase ends here in this room, and immediately on your right exiting the room like a real tucked kitty corner is another staircase however it does not go very far at all it seems to be blocked as its ceiling has been completely collapsed in a rubble of stone does that head downward or upward downward ah blocked downward okay are we free to move about you are free to move about as i am taking note of your ride and perception checks and will reveal the scene as they pop up and as i quickly scan walk into the room Okay. Ah, smells old. Now take note, tracker. Do you see any disturbance on the floor that might lead to a culprit? Be quick about it. So taking a, a torch out before I go down, I spark it up and um, and bring uh, myself and Barkley down the stairwell. And I, I rolled a ride check at 24. I think that should be okay. good enough to get him to... Yeah, you're, you're free to... Oh, Yes, well, thank you for the ride check for moving a wolf downstairs. There is a lot of debate about that in the Pathfinder community, but with an epic roll of over 20, I'm pretty sure that even the naysayers will just have to, uh, you know, bear with us. Feel free to move your mount about. Yeah, I'm a little too laggy to move my mount about. It won't let me. All right, but, so I'll bring, in, I'll bring you into play. Here you go. Sweet. So, so importantly, <laughs> stop lagging about. I need your aid. As soon as I come into the room, I'll take a look and, and tell everybody... Be be still, be still. You may disturb any lingering tracks. Oh, very well. 
and I will do a survival check. I will aid survival check. A casty, sorry, El Casty, uh-huh. lights a torch, uh. and then fumbles about with a light crossbow in one hand. <clears throat> does he look at all competent with that crossbow? Yes, he does seem to like you know cleverly lift a knee, brace it against the wall, you type of thing. But he needs to see what he's doing. So first he goes off of like pulling it out and everything, going off of Winston's light. But since everyone's kind of buggered off ahead of him, you kind of see him pull into light where he's you know half playing with the torch and half playing with the crossbow. He looks a little bit uh, encumbered since you you can technically fire a crossbow at negative four with one hand, and it'll take you a long time to reload it. But then again, you know it's not his job to defend you; just probably himself. Is he a danger? Does he look untrained? No, he does look like he has the simple weapon proficiency and can use such okay. If that's what you're worried about, I just he's want to see taking, if he's, he's taking uh, a little bit extra time fumbling about. So I guess I shouldn't use the word fumble. That's uh, <laughs> that scares us. I do have the critical fumble deck and uh, critical hit deck here in front of me for use, gentlemen. Mm. Best of um, luck. So um, I uh, I did not do well on my survival check. I got a seven. Mm-hmm. And Sir Bartholomew was of uh, less aid than I anticipated. Okay. Yeah. Um, a low growl ensues from Barkley, but it's more of a I don't like this place as opposed to I found something and he points. You know what I mean? It's very damp down here. It's enclosed. The wolf's not very impressed. And he's letting you know it. Nobody likes a damp. No one likes a damps. I'm looking at a whole bunch of perception, boys. Okay. It, Out it, of five. Yep. <laughs> five. Yeah. That's Lord Gildervath, the perceptive. The perceptive. Yeah. I Got see my torch. You actually hold the torch like right in front of you, so that's Oh, all. my God. Right. Look at the colors. <laughs> this is not I'm, going well. This is going, going great for me. <laughs> I got a six. Uh-huh. Is this a new round, round of perceptions? Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh, my. Perception 12. I got a nine again. Oh. Yep. A nine again. A yes. ten. Yes, when I'm when I'm done with my eight again, I drink my nine again. <laughs> yes. Bartholomew can move to, hear each other, right? and Gildervarth will point towards the double doors that look like they are directly to the east. Mm-hmm. Check those doors and see if they've been used recently. Tapo, cover us all. Uh, Bartholomew. You, places, Winston. you others, move about the cabin. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing Bartholomew's percept. Oh, 11. Okay, I got it here. All right. Okay. Uh, I will tell you this, gentlemen. Even if it was a relatively easy DC of 10, the sort of tanking and stacking, and, you know, we're not exactly doing the silent SWAT team. You know, maybe when you guys are higher level and sort of meet your stride, there'll be this awesome SWAT team of Cavaliers that stack oh. up on a corner and Stealth make is not. But- yeah, stealth is not. You guys all tromping did, down and ordering each other about. And if there was something to hear, it's pretty much covered by you know your, each other. If there's something to see, we have not yet discovered it. But the smell, the dampness, is definitely apparent. Um, so at the door, uh, mm-hmm. the, is the floor covered in dust? Uh, yeah, it's kind of dusty down here. Okay. Little now bit. the door just swing in, in or out. Which side of the hinges is it on? Uh, the door's open towards you. Towards it. Okay, so I it all looks, look at the ground. It does look like the door has swept the floor at all any time lately. Survival perception. Uh, surviving my perception checks. Yes. Ten. Uh, yes. It does look like there's a, a minute trace that the door has been used recently. I think this door has opened recently. Probably by by the undead. Beware. By the miscreant. <clears throat> uh, oh, Bartholomew, no, cast those doors open. Right. Uh. Open, swing open both double doors. Bam, bam. Okay. Bartholomew swings open both doors and is immediately met with hostile crossbow fire. We'll see you next time. Gentlemen, roll for initiative and best of luck. Whoops. <laughs> oh, awesome. my. I'm glad I could get you killed. You're welcome. You are listening to... Oh, my God. The things I do for my husband. You have no idea. You are listening to a Role Monger actual play podcast production. Thank you. Now you may go. Going to my trailer now.